Recorded live at Tox and Tasting Studios, it's the Clerical Errors Podcast. The podcast that shows you what's behind the collar. Let's go. From the Tox and Tastings Studios, this is the Clerical Errors Podcast. The podcast that shows you what's behind the collar. This is Bullhagen. This is Berg. And this is Vicker. And Peter's here. Hey, Pete. Hey, Pete. So, yeah, we got the whole band together again. Berg said he's tired. We'll, we'll take care of that. I know how to get Berg going. Indeed. So, <laughs> yeah, we're we're uh, getting ready here for the, the, the great snowstorm. What you would call there in Wyoming flurries. I think we're supposed I'm to I'm get... in it already. Are you? Are you really? Yeah. I went, to, I went home from work early because I didn't want to get stuck. Oh. Yeah. Well, that's coming our way, so... But you probably have, what, three feet on the ground right now, Berg? Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's quite a bit. We actually got some overnight. It wasn't forecasted or anything. We've got great trustees here who come and clean everything away. Now, I wish they would clean the streets off a little bit better. I mean, when you got to rev up my little red car to get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they leave, like, curbs in the middle of the street, snow curbs. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so... But that's because they don't know how to move is snow that, here. Is that the Chevy Volt or <laughs> Spark or what is it? <laughs> no, Chevy Cruise. Cruise. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. Someday we'll have to upgrade to maybe a little more oomph, but I don't know. Maybe I'm just waiting for everything to deflate. <laughs> right. <laughs> Good call. So what are you drinking there, Berg? I see you sipping something already. I am drinking George Dickel Tennessee Bottled in Bond Whiskey. Mm. Ooh. So Bottle in Bond Act of 1897 is an old law, but it's an important one to know. To be considered bonded, the whiskey must be from a single distillation a season and distillery. It must be aged for at least four years, and it must be unaltered from its original character, except using pure water to reduce proof to 100 degrees. This batch of George Dickel you're holding abides by this law. If you have any doubts, just give us a call. We'll vouch for it personally. Wow, you know, I like I like the personal touch. Is it? I, w- I wonder. Do they sell much whiskey that's un- that's not diluted, like straight barrel? Yeah, I mean, you can get higher proof whiskey. I mean, you a lot of the whiskeys you drink are forty percent or eighty proof. Yeah. Um, if it comes straight out of a single cask or a single barrel, as they call it, usually it's between fifty four and fifty seven percent, which is so- just not as enjoyable in a lot of ways. I right. know for sure uh, Makers Makers has cask strength that they sell. Didn't we try that once? I think we probably did. Yeah, oh, that's right. We did. Was that the one we got at uh, Costco? Oh, you're right. You're right. Yeah, yeah. That was the one. <laughs> um, Yeah. So what do you think about cask strength, Peter? Uh, I think it depends on what your goal is. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, if, you're, if, you're, if your goal is to enjoy some good whiskey... Maybe that's up to you. If your goal is to drink whiskey, it's sufficient. It, it is. I mean, I got a cast strength bottle out from Abelauer over in Scotland, and that was great. But you almost needed a little bit of water just to open it up a little bit. So, sure. you know, coming from a single cask, I mean, it has a distinctive flavor. I mean, that's the thing that people don't realize about whiskeys is the spirit has a different effect with every different barrel. And so this is why they actually have people who are trained to say, okay, you need, in order to get this kind of standard taste, you need this barrel, this barrel, and this barrel, and you need to mix them together. A blended whiskey. Yeah. Well, blended whiskeys are uh, also include grain alcohol, which is why they have less of a a strength to them. So like, for example, a grain whiskey would be, oh, my dad likes to drink it. Um. I don't. I don't know. Crown Royal. So, bullet. Bullet. No, not bullet. Um, I I'll think of it later. But but that's the thing is usually this is why they call single malt as opposed to blended because single malt doesn't use these different grain type whiskeys. They use malt, you know, malt and barley and that sort of thing. So, wow, learning a lot today. I've got a sparkling water. What do you got, Vicker? I brought some Lafroig Select. Hey. Um, Good job, I, man. I finally finished off my uh, Glen Fittich, so I branched out and got some Lafroy, which is a single malt. Oh. So yeah. the congregation I, didn't get that as a uh, a Christmas present for you? No, no. I got this uh, 
back home. I was looking around for something new, and this was the only thing in my price range. So give me just a little taste of there. Yeah, just oh. a little taste of that. Yeah, the the select is so good. I love it. I like Lafroig better than Lagavulin because it has uh, it doesn't have that iodine taste. Sometimes you're into okay. that, you know. But I've always I've found actually- Lagavulin to have kind of this iodiney taste to it. So. I've never actually had Lagavulin, so I'll have to watch out for that. Yeah, you should. It's awesome. Life is awesome, guys. You know why? Because we're <laughs> in the that? epiphany season. Hey! That's right. Oh. Yeah. That's awesome. And Vicar gets to preach. Yeah. Yeah, so let me pull up the... Um, and I'm dying to find out what, what uh, Vicar's preaching on, because his sermon's due here pretty soon. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> so... Yeah, so it's epiphany two. No, that's not right. Sorry. Epiphany 3. If I can pull up the right one. Yeah, we've got to fly through Epiphany because uh, Lent starts so early this year. I know. Isn't it great? Yeah. I love it. Um, March Easter. I love it when Ash Wednesday falls on Valentine's Day. Oh, it's got me in the three year. That's why I'm confused. You got this, Vic. When, when you open Lutheran Service Builder, it should just automatically go to one year. It should. You should write a letter. I'm that's going to right. write a letter to the editor. Yeah. We still have to do our P.O. box here, right? So people can send us angry mail. They barely send us emails. <laughs> hey, while Vicar is looking that up, we did get an email from we Hannah. Oh, yeah, I don't think she she liked the birthday song I sent her. So that's all I'm going to say about that. She said, Dear Pastor Bullhagen. So this is to Bullhagen. Oh, man. Mm. Thank you for the would have box of snickerdoodles. I definitely would have eaten them. I also would have eaten molasses, crinkles, or Russian tea cakes. Mm-mm. Hmm. Thank you also for the would have Chris Christian t-shirt. I would have really learned his name properly. Ha. Ah. Um, she says, I started to listen to this week's episode when Baby Flip Flop woke me early on Sunday morning. I had to work hard to keep my laughter silent. Even so, Baby Flip Flop broke off nursing to stare at his shaking mother. I enjoyed the ad so much that I played it for our Vicar 2.0 later that day. Excellent work. Your proud podcast mom, Hannah. Well, Aww. well, thank you, Hannah. That's a that's a kind of the I appreciate it because you know when you do something kind of strange or silly, what do you do? You look you look at the mom to see is she laughing, ah. <laughs> right? Well, see, you've been so afraid to get into politics. It worked. It worked. Yeah. <laughs> it worked. No one's gonna vote for Vicar. <laughs> I guarantee you. <laughs> It's the perfect plan, really. <laughs> All right, so, Vicar, did you find the text? I found it, yeah. So it is, the Old Testament is Exodus 33, which is thus. Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And he said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, If your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us, so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other nation, every other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, This very thing that you have spoken I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, Please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he said, You cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a There is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand, take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. So basically what's going on here is Moses is struggling with what the Lord has has just told him. So at the beginning of the chapter, he's, he's told them that they need to go away from Sinai and enter the promised land by themselves that the Lord will not lead them because of their their wickedness that because of their they are a stiff-necked people. And so Moses <laughs> and the rest of the Israelites are really struggling with this. Well, how are we going to know where to go if you will not lead us? 
And why, why aren't you going to be with us? Why aren't you doing these things? And so the thing that I really want to focus on is, uh, I think it can be boiled down to the question, where is God? Where is God in all of this? And where are we going to find him? Now in the struggle, Moses asks to see God and God reveals himself physically to him and he beholds his glory. And so I'm going to, con- I want to connect that also then with the, the gospel reading, which is Jesus at the wedding of Cana, where Jesus reveals his glory through the power of that miracle, the changing the water into the wine, how he, uh, Moses has beheld his, the glory of the Lord. And we now behold the glory of Christ through his revealing himself to us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and, uh, which is kind of the the theme of epiphany right in this discussion you were kind of bouncing back between the two texts and my my opinion was it sounded like you actually needed to preach the gospel the old testament reading and then reference the gospel reading right yeah the, the whole question is set up with the old testament but it's, it's then answered with the gospel right because people often often have that question why is god hidden Right. Yeah. There's so many times and in so many different ways, people can ask, well, where is God? Like there'd be some, something happening to them in their life and they'll, they could ask where, where was God in this? Right. I've talked with many like atheists and agnostics who that's, that's their sort of line to go through with, well, where was God when Hitler rose to power? Where was God when blah, blah, blah happened? I mean, I think it's a very pertinent question, especially right now with everything that's happening in the world. Well, where is God in all of this? And what is what is happening? Where is he at? Yeah. So where is God? How, where, what's the ultimate conclusion that you come up with, Vicar? Well, God reveals himself through his church. So, of course, he's, he comes to us through the word, right? The spoken mm-hmm. and the preached word. He comes to us through his red word. He also comes to us in our baptism, obviously. That's the, the kind of standard Vicar answer there. If, I mean, if we saw his glory all the time, where would faith play? Exactly. Right? That's a good way when you talk about the kingdom of heaven of when faith becomes reality, the things that you hope for you see. Right. I mean, God revealed himself to Moses so that Moses would be comforted in those promises that he, would, that he was given, that God is with him and that his favor is upon Moses. And in the same way, he has given us physical signs, mm-hmm. uh, the sacraments, right? Mm-hmm. And of course, he did this with the other patriarchs as well, like the sign of circumcision with Abraham and and other examples. Very good, Vicar. I look forward to seeing your sermon. Are, are you? Uh, do you have what is the uh, the missile project? Does that have any? Uh, do you have that course, with you, Berg? You ask me. The one time I don't have it pulled up here. Oh, <laughs> oh, ahead of him. All right. So the Wednesday is Luke four fourteen through twenty two. Which is, okay, Uh, Jesus rejected at Nazareth. So where he preaches in Nazareth, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the recovery of the sight of the blind, et cetera, et cetera. And then he says, look, this has been fulfilled in your hearing. And they end up rejecting him. And then on Friday, the gospel reading is... Luke 4, it's a continuation of that reading, which is, uh, well, no, it's actually a little bit farther down. And then Jesus went to C- Capernaum. He cleans, out, he cleans out a demon, does an exorcism, and they were all amazed about, with it. So, Okay, I, I, I like the, the tie-in in, in the sense of what, what you just said, Vicar, in the fact that here he was in his hometown— Mm-hmm. And the glory of God was there in Christ. And what did they do? They threw him out. Right. And when you look at what God said to Moses, it was kind of a mutual decision. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it wasn't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was because, I mean, to an extent, Moses was kind of complaining about the people too, right? Right. Like, well, these are your people. How am I supposed to lead them? <laughs> these aren't mine. <laughs> yes. All right. So I have a top. 14 list what <laughs> yeah part okay part is because there are 14 and i stole it okay <laughs> that makes more sense yes peter peter play the intro enough nonsense it's time 
for Bullhagen's Top 12. I'm sure two of them could be made honorable mentions. Well, the thing is, uh, uh, so what I have here is I, I uh, somehow got into looking at the, the very first constitution of our synod. I believe it was passed in uh, uh, May 20th, 1846. A long time ago. Yep. Just a few years ago. And and uh, the one of the items there is the business of synod, and there are fourteen of them. And so, since there are fourteen, you know, who am I to say? But I would like to give them in reverse order, naturally, so that because their number one would be obviously number one, right? And so, so uh, I thought this would be a good thing to to talk about because this shows, you know, one hundred and seventy five years ago. How many years was that? Eh. Yeah, about. 180 how, something. How it shows at that point, what did the synod think the synod should be doing? That makes sense, doesn't it, Berg? Always. Because I think sometimes we, we get a little lost in what a synod should actually be doing, right? Yeah, it's interesting to see how the synod is now and what it originally set out to do when it was formed. Right, so Peter, you're not well-versed in this stuff. That's correct. So like, if we had to ask you, what does a synod to be doing what would you say? Uh, uh, keeping God's word, God's word. Okay. All right. How about you, Vicar? Like, because you probably haven't read much of this, and you have you done much thinking about what a synod should actually be doing? Uh, n- not really, no. So, what do you think a synod should be doing? I suppose some sort of outreach. Okay, outreach. Okay. Right. Coming up with good logos. Yes, like triple crosses. <laughs> right. <laughs> that don't cross. <laughs> Yes. Uh, by the way, it's okay when you're a pastor and you you make the you bless people. To oh do yes, that. I've seen that. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty cool. And it's actually changed colors. It used to be purple. Now it's blue. I I know. Yeah. So, so yeah, are you guys, uh, you waiting with anxious to see what these are? <laughs> Can barely sit in my seat. <laughs> All right, number fourteen. <laughs> All right. To establish connection with a Lutheran church in foreign countries, especially Germany. I'm not surprised by that one. Right? That makes sense. It's it's odd, though, because uh, uh, the Lutheran church in Germany isn't... The, it shows you how how different we are than as a, as a Lutheran church body. Because now, when you think of the biggest Lutheran churches and the most important, you don't really look at Germany anymore. Right? I, I don't think that was the point, though. What the was point the point? Is, I think the point is is that you love those who are related to you, and you want them to be Christian. Okay, and some since, more about establishing you know, fellowship. I think it has more to do with, hey, we actually want our brothers in blood to be our brothers in faith, which is right. something I think all of us want, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I wish we had more Lutheran American churches that we were in fellowship with, because... I love this country and I love Americans. Mm-hmm. I think that's something we don't maybe think about enough that like these are people who share our language, share some of our culture. I mean, we should want them to be united with us. I mean, this is what the synodical conference used to be. Right. Right. I mean, right. And I imagine like if, if um, the Lutheran churches in Africa, for example, if if they were to really get more organized, right, and then come up with a constitution, they would probably have to establish connections with the Lutheran Church in foreign countries, especially the United States, at some point. Yeah, well, I mean, there are even African churches that are working to do that right now. Yeah. Right. Right, and, you know, but also with their brothers in the faith, right, on the African right. continent. And that's great, you know. I mean, yeah. we should actually care about our neighbors, those who are near us. That's why I think, honestly, we should be doing a lot more for home missions than what we're doing now. Yeah, that was this something that I think um, there was a change when you when the Lutherans first came in here. They came in with the idea that that America was this great opportunity for growth of the church, and yeah. then at some point it switched to when you, when we think of missions, it's overseas or some other place. Mm-hmm. Because I, I mean. Yeah, I mean, think of how far the Missouri Senate came. Because, like, 
when they went with Stefan, Martin Stefan, they're like, well, the last pillar of, you know, the Christian church is leaving Germany, right? The last, you know, holdout of Lutheranism, we're all leaving. And I mean, it was basically a cult. Oh, I'm sorry, cultish. Excuse me. Right. And then they're like, no, hey, we actually want to, you know, just what, 15, 20 years <laughs> later, they're like, hey, we actually want to establish uh, ties with our mother country because we love our brothers that we left behind. And they were having to get their pastors from Germany, too, at that point, early S- on. Yeah, some of them. I mean, the Saxons were definitely way more self-sufficient than like right. uh, the Leia, you know, those sent by Leia or even the Winniconites, right? So, mm-hmm. All right, number 13. <laughs> to gather church statistics within Synod and also start a chronicle of American Lutheranism. Well, that worked out pretty well for him. Right. I mean, every pastor be- from the- loves filling out their statistics, <laughs> right? <laughs> hey, I tell you what. We just had a pastor die here. So he was a he was the pastor of this congregation before he got sick and then slowly died over the last 10 years. We do not know where he was baptized, when he was baptized, where he was confirmed, or when he was confirmed. Wow. So stats are kind of important. <laughs> right. It, 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 I mean, if you... <laughs> I know we don't like filling them out, but, you know, like, it's good to actually have, like, I don't know, when people were baptized, when. Because, you know, we do a lot of preaching on the importance of people's baptism, and we specifically, they have to receive it by faith, because the majority of people who have been baptized in the Lutheran Church don't remember it. Mm -hmm. So they kind of have to go by some of the statistics, and yeah. word of mouth. I mean, this is why I'm kind of like, we should send a card to everyone in the congregation on their baptismal birth date. Because then it would remind them. And then even on their confirmation date, because then it's like, oh, well, you know, maybe this stuff was... For those like, who actually believe in confirmation, Berg, right? Well, you know, <laughs> if, you made, if you made those vows, you should actually keep them. There you go. Uh, is it? But what if you made them when you're only 13? Do they still? Uh... Luther would like to have a word. <laughs> Number 12. To support indigent congregations who are members of synod, that they may obtain the regular service of a pastor. That one is so important. I don't even know how to even you talk about it. I mean, like, and unfortunately, it doesn't happen. And this right. is this also is still something that the synod today is struggling with. Mm-hmm. But even but even before the shortage of pastors, think of how many non-calling vacancies there are. One is too many. Right. One is too many. You tell me that whatever they spent on the district convention, like a billion dollars every second. It seems like a bit of an exaggeration, but I get your point. <laughs> well, you know, I like using uh, hyperbole, for it. right? <laughs> but, the, but the thing is, is why not use that to, I don't know, get pastoral care? Because, I mean, let, let's be honest, the health insurance plans are crazy. Yeah. People pay more now for our health insurance than I made my first year as a pastor. And, and by the way, housing is becoming the same issue. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Right? Housing is is gonna is falling right in line where pastor if they don't have a parsonage to pay housing anymore if you expect a pastor to to purchase a house and you want to pay a pastor enough housing that they could be able to use that money to purchase a house that that's going to become increasingly an issue. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, like where I'm at, I thank God that they had a parsonage because. To even make the 20% down payment on a house, I would have had to drop like $70,000 minimum. Yeah. And I mean, I save a lot, but I don't save that much. <laughs> right. So. And if you, and pastors at that point, you know, we're, we're already serving more than one parish. And right. we're also generally actively planting churches as well. You know, if, if you want to, 
a pastor wants to feel lazy, just read of what pastors were doing yeah, right. back then when they weren't preoccupied with their cell phones. At the same time, I mean, this is not a call to laziness. But I mean, I know a guy in the Wyoming district, he drives from, from Grover, Colorado, up to Wheatland, and then over to Pine Bluffs, I believe. I mean, the dude drives like the equivalent of the state of Maryland every Sunday for church. Wow. So, I mean, like, indigent congregations. Number 11. To have concern for the faithful execution of all the duties of the ministry, especially of the truly evangelical care of souls in all its branches. In this respect, also, to help advance sound catechumen in instruction above all, and especially with reference to the false doctrines of the prominent sects. Also, to institute and maintain catechizations every Sunday for the confirmed youth. How do you like that one, Berg? (laughs) Oh, wouldn't that that be awesome? (laughs) Well, honestly, I mean, this is where the unbelievers do it better than we do. The Mormons are all on the same lesson. You can go to any, uh, you can go to any Mormon steakhouse (laughs) and they're teaching the same thing. Yeah. I know worst steakhouse ever, right? It did not meet expectations. The Mormon Steakhouse didn't meet expectations. <laughs> oh, that joke was a little too well, well done. I didn't expect to get grilled on this bird. <laughs> but I mean, That's rare. rare jokes. That's yeah. rare. Uh, so anyway, I mean, honestly, like you well look done. at catechesis. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, you're fine. I just said, well done. Good job. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, now I lost my train of thought. Uh, but it, I mean, in terms of cate- catechesis, catechesis has gone way down. Bullhagen, you've seen this. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's terrible. From when you started as a pastor, I bet even 10 years ago, it wasn't this bad. Right. And the and quality the quality of what kids can actually learn has especially less. gone down. Right. So it's kind of like, okay, maybe Senate really does need to focus in on this. And right. I mean, honestly, I've moved my catechism class to Sunday after church. You know why? Because you, you have, have to, to go to church. You have to go to church to be in catechism class. <laughs> <laughs> right. But that's the thing is we can't even all get on the same lectionary. Right. Yeah. Much less, and, you know, teach the same stuff in it, Bible class and in catechism class and, every and Sunday. And teaching them to, to recognize false teaching. Right. I mean, yeah. when has the Senate ever come up with a Bible study like, you know, the errors of the UCC or the errors of the Methodist Church? <laughs> right. That'd be pretty rad if they did. I, I mean, really, like, it wouldn't that be that hard to write up. What if we did that on the show? We hmm. could actually do that on the show. We could. Berg, I mean, do you think you could get, like, I want to emphasize here, because I know you're going to go full bore. Don't go full bore. <laughs> do a weekly, like, five-minute discussion on a different sect and say the, these are the errors. I can, yeah, I, I can give it my give it my best, you know? And right. Super, super. I, don't want you to, I don't want you to put, like, your entire week into this, because <laughs> I know you will. Yeah, I mean, it could actually be something... You know, but that's the thing is like, yeah, nobody wants to be mean nowadays. Everyone wants right. to be mean. I got nice. a title for it already. I got a title for it. Uh, Berg's Five Minutes of Sex. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Peter, take that out. <laughs> Come on. No, 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 that has you just to... have to pronounce the T a little more. Yep, yeah, yep, you gotta yep. pronounce that T a little more. Yeah. All right. Berg's Le- Five Minutes of Sect. S- S- is that better? Sect. Sect. S- all right. So <laughs> So the big thing is is right? I mean, we should be engaging like particular things. I mean, yeah. You know, I mean, if they say something dumb, we should even even having uh, a renewed culture in the church of learning. Right. Something like just very We don't simple. have that anymore hardly in many ways. Well, yeah. And- There's no robust culture of constant improvement and learning and gaining of knowledge, especially in the things of right. God. Well, I, I, I don't know. I, I think I took my people back here uh, on Sunday because I read a verse of Hebrews and about, you know, why do we call it a testament and not a covenant? 
And it's like, so I read a verse and I said, okay, explain this to me in your own words. And it was just like such a foreign concept. And it's like, no, the Bible, you know, this is the one thing that the historical critics got right. The Bible is as easy to understand as other kinds of literature. It's not an opaque book. It is clear. In fact, it's clearer than almost every other type of literature. Right. And that's that's the lie that's often is that is used is when you talk about the clearness of Scripture and Scripture says this, well, that's your interpretation. Do you remember with, when the Roman Catholics came down for talks and tastings and tried to catch you on that? No, I don't remember <laughs> that. What happened? It was awesome. So did I handle I did I handle it correctly? Yeah, yeah, it went it went well. Okay. So <laughs> number ten, to strive after the greatest possible uniformity in ceremonies. <laughs> Can we bring that back too? <laughs> Why do we exist? Uniformity. And you talk about the world outside the church understands this. Like, doesn't McDonald's understand this? Yeah, that's why <laughs> yeah. it's uniform. You, 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 you were an assistant manager at McDonald's once, weren't you? <laughs> yeah, so I used like, to work for a McDonald's. Yeah. Explain. I mean... The, the stress on uniformity. I mean, that's the purpose of... Well, first, the uniform is that so... So now, no matter where you go, you know who's a manager, who's not, who you need to go to if you have a complaint or whatever no matter where you go it's going to be the same same thing you know you go to seattle washington it's going to be mcdonald's you go to austin texas it's going to be the regular mcdonald's it's not like bob's bar and grill where no matter where you go it's going to be something different you, you always know you're going to get a big mac right yeah and that's not something that happens anymore no. at a time where we are a more mobile society right oh yeah increasingly important we've become less uniform mm -hmm. in it. And why? Because I think we like our own personal things. <laughs> right. But that, that was to strive after the greatest, greatest possible uniformity in ceremonies. And that, that also provides protection for the congregation too and the pastor. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it does. Right? Sometimes it's good as a circuit to say, we want uniformity in this things for a circuit because it affects one another. And that might help a congregation say, okay, uh, we've been doing it this way, but in order for the sake of the other churches in the circuit, we'll, <clears throat> we'll uh, seek to have uniform in ceremonies. And that's a great way to help, especially when the uniformity is good. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's the thing is like, you can't be a weirdo. Right. Like, you can be a weirdo in your private life. That's fine. <laughs> but keep it private. Do you know another place where they <laughs> yeah. de they, they demanded uniformity and everyone agreed? It was like the Lutheran confessions. <laughs> yeah, imagine that. <laughs> yeah. But that's the thing is like there are too many, like, and this, I mean, this goes on all sides of the spectrum here, whether it be the high and crazy or the low and lazy or the broad and hazy. I oh, like wait, that. Th oh, wait, that's the Anglicans. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I think it applies to the Lutheran church too. It's like, no, I mean, I would love for there to be, I mean, honestly, let's be honest. They aren't different settings in the LSB. They're different liturgies because they have mm -hmm. different words. Different settings is when you have the same words to different music. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you want to have different liturgies, I mean, I'm against that because, you know, we should strive for uniformity because, you know, I mean, first constitution of the LCMS or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, the main thing is, is like, just call a thing what it is. If you want to have different liturgies, then just say so. Number nine. To take over judicial cases, but only when synod is asked to do so. So. Yeah, because you shouldn't sue your brother. Right. Yeah. I mean, right. Vicar, find where that is in First Corinthians. But the fact that uh, you know <clears throat> that we are stronger together in that way, in the in the legal sense, that we can we have more resources to protect one another. Well, and if we have disputes with one another, we shouldn't bring it before right. the pagan courts. We should be right. able to decide these things ourselves. Right. And that's happened a lot over the years of where we ask lawyers and judges to to settle our disputes. 
Yeah, I mean, like I can understand if somebody is not, sta- you know, fulfilling their end of the bargain and not acting Christian, but then that means if, you know, <laughs> they're not being Christian, like, well, then maybe they should be put under discipline if they're not right. acting like Christians. Or if they're trying to steal or something like that. Mm-hmm. Right. Or, you know, forcibly remove somebody who shouldn't be removed. Yeah. So. Did you find it, Vicar? I did find it. You want me to read the whole thing? It's 1 through 11. Uh, oh, do it. Chapter 6, 1 through 11. He says, Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? I say this to you, not even one... Excuse me, I skipped a line. I say this to your shame. It is so that there is not a wise man among you, not even one, who will be able to judge between his brethren. But brother goes to law against brother and that before unbelievers. Now, therefore, it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? No, you yourselves do wrong and cheat, and you do those things to your brethren. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed. But you were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. I mean, what a beautiful passage. Yeah. This is what you were. This is what you are. This is what in the world to come you will be. You will judge the world. The saints will judge the world. The saints will judge angels. We will be priests and we will be kings. So why not work these things out among ourselves? Right. Right? I mean, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, I look at Abraham, right? He was the uncle and he had the promise of God with Lot. And yet what did he say to Lot? Take what you will. Yeah. Go which way you will. He gave up his right to choose first to maintain peace. And he's not the only one in the Bible that's done this. So like, isn't it isn't it better to be wronged in a slight way right. than than to wrong somebody else? I don't know. I now I'm not and, saying and, let them you know destroy you completely. But there's such a rush to be offended. <laughs> yeah. Right. Or to fight over scraps. Right. I, so because a lot of a lot of times it's it's not even about the stuff anymore. It's about winning. Yeah. yeah well, it's about I mean, their own. Bullhagen, you've seen this and you've heard of. Uh, Funeral directors, when are people the best and their worst? At mom's funeral. That's right. Right? (laughs) Yeah. Because then it really comes out and it shows what do people really think. Right. Their their true confession. You know, so are you going to fight over something dumb or are you going to take the wrong? Right. Number eight. To provide for congregations without pastors if the former apply to synod. Hmm. That's what's going to happen with vicar, so. Right, so congregations, uh, if you apply to synod and you don't have a pastor. They'll send you one. Yeah, or try. Yeah, and and right now they will get one. (laughs) (laughs) Right, right now we have more, those more applying well, that's right. But, I mean, the class sizes are growing. Yeah. I mean, this the one behind me was, I think, 15 or 20 more people than my class size, and I think the newest one is even bigger than that one. Well, good. Good. Number seven. The preparation of future preachers and teachers for service in the church. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's important, right? Oh, yeah. Not, uh, I mean, that's why we have the vast and large Concordia system. Exactly. <laughs> and it's working and so well. <laughs> I mean, they were started for this yeah. reason. Mm-hmm. You know, at some point they they became uh, outreach universities mm-hmm. rather than, you know, there for the the sake of training uh, pastors and teachers. 
Yeah, weren't the Concordia's originally just teacher colleges? Yeah. That's a, yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how or when that exactly changed, but pretty much <coughs> part of it is, well, I think there are more Lutheran schools. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but I think uh, right now when we're dealing with all sorts of different uh, troubles within our city with universities, the, the biggest thing is, is the vast majority of folks at our universities aren't Lutheran anymore. And, well, and then we still rely on that setting Mm -hmm. to produce our teachers and preachers and teachers. And I would say, even when it comes to college education, I imagine the percentage of seminarians who came from a non-concordia is pretty high. Yeah, I, I, I think that's been my experience, yeah. So, any comments, Berg? Just reminds me of the country hymn by uh, Ronnie Millsap. She keeps the home <laughs> fires burning. Yeah. Sure. I, no, we were all thinking the same thing. Oh, Ronnie Millsap, no, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's serious, right? I mean, I'm serious about this because, like, let's be honest. You don't keep the home fires burning. They, they gut her out. Like, how can you reach out to others if you don't, like, secure your base, right? Right. So, I mean, that's what Lutheran education should be. That's what it always was. Until they moved to this missionary right. idea that, oh, well, mm-hmm. we'll reach out. Well, you got to make sure your base is secure. Yeah. Instead right. of watering it all down. So yeah. I've had, I've had like I uh, said, people. So as you can see, my country references really do work here. I'm trying to relate to you people. I, like I, I have a question <laughs> for all the pastors listening. Okay. How often have you had, has it ever happened where you've had a member in your congregation, a youth, being recorded to go, re- recruited to go to one of the Concordias because of their athletic ability. And how many have you been recruited to be church workers? I bet uh, uh, more of the, your students have been recruited by Concordia to be a basketball player mm-hmm. or a football player than they have been to be a pastor or a school teacher. Number six. To provide for ecclesiastical ordination and induction into office. That's pretty standard, right? Yeah. Still going? Yep. Check. I mean, doesn't that kind of just follow from, from the whole seminary and university system? Did that really need to be said? Yeah, because you had yahoos who wouldn't be ordained, you know? Oh, fair enough. Okay. Right. And number five goes right along with this. Number five. Conscientious examination of candidates for the ministry and teaching profession. Use uh, the phrase rostered for that, don't we? If someone's rostered, yeah, well, yeah. we assume that they've been uh, taught and examined. Mm-hmm. We assume it. I, <laughs> I, I would love to have circuits examine potential candidates. Oh, that sounds like fun. Right. That would be awesome. Yeah. Well, you had to go through this, right? You had to have an interview. Well, I haven't had my theological interview yet. No, I mean, uh, even to go into the seminary, you had to be examined. Oh, yeah. Ah, You know what mine was? They were like, well, what's your faith faith walk like? It's like, lady, you're barking up the (laughs) wrong tree. (laughs) Oh, it'll be a fly on the wall. That, that's okay. back when I was, you know, still nice. See, I, I thought you've calmed down since then. I thought you were even more fiery back then. No, no. <laughs> he was fiery, but less jaded. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Because you were a wrestler, right? I was. I All mean, right. didn't you tell us a couple of weeks ago about how you beat somebody up because they <laughs> were saying bad theology? <sighs> Did I? Huh. Yeah. I gotta think back to Wasn't that. Wasn't that him? I vaguely remember something like yeah. that. No, well, in seminary, I know there was this one guy, you know, he, he kind of liked to be a, an alpha male. And so I just wrestled him to the ground and, you know, put him in his place. Yeah. And then there was Maybe another guy was who of. was like, Did he yeah, spill his, did it, you know, did he spill his Frappuccino? <laughs> <laughs> well, and then there was another guy. He's like, oh, jujitsu is so cool. And I was just like, wonk. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, sometimes I think that might not be the worst thing at seminary, (laughs) right? Athletic competition in some way, shape or form. 
Maybe we'd get a discount on the health plan. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, maybe. It definitely helped to make it cheaper. So Right. Because, it, you know, back in the day, pastor was seen as a, a very masculine thing to be. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Well, what's my what's my theory? Have you heard my theory? Yes, you've told me your theory. What's my theory? You like a good seven up now and again. No? God wanted what? men to be pastors, not just because of their plumbing. That's right. Right. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Carl. It's yes. my house, Bullhagen. <laughs> Number four. A publication and distribution of a church periodical. Periodical. How periodical. Does per- periodical. Yes. Yes. I was getting I was thinking of the parable apparently. Yeah. <laughs> Parabotical. <laughs> Which is funny. A. I like the, the singular. <laughs> yeah. Not not multiple competing, but <laughs> <laughs> Right. Which is good because their whole idea was uf- uniformity, right? It helps to the unity thing, yeah. Right. Number three. Common protection and extension of the church. I'm for that. No- what exactly does that mean, Berg? Common extension of the church? Protection and extension of the church. Protection? Protection. Protection and, and extension. Yeah. So The thing that comes to mind for me is the uh, when uh, gay marriage was legalized and people were like, hey, let's we're going to go get married in LC- LCMS churches. We're going to go make them do it. And the Senate was like, no, you're not. Right. It sounds like uh, it. it's to protect from losing churches and... Also, not just to not lose churches, but to gain new churches, so by planting or whatnot. Right. Yeah. Oh. The protection would be against false doctrine, despair, and other great shame and vice, and the expansion of the churches, maybe planting new churches, missionary activities, et cetera, et cetera, whether that be abroad or at home. I mean, anything that's not covered. I mean, I figure this is a general protection and expansion of the church right here in this podcast. So, boom, we could be synod. Boom. Boom, synod. <laughs> Put us on payroll. Yeah, that's right. No, I'm and ser- buy a t-shirt. I'm serious. <laughs> like, people listen to this stuff, right? That you do. We yeah. protect them from false doctrine, and we expand the church. I mean, I figure we're doing but- synod's job for them. So, you know, you're welcome, synod. Papa yeah. needs a new graphics card. <laughs> as, it says, uh, as it says, of a church pro- periodical... <laughs> Which would be like the Lutheran um, witness. Right. right. But I think it's us now. <laughs> it's true. We're actually more <laughs> frequent and more reliable than the Lutheran witness. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> That's maybe the worst burn you could have given the <laughs> Lutheran Boom, witness. Boom, periodical. <laughs> Number two. Supervision over the performance of the official duties on the part of pastors and teachers of synod. Yep. That sounds like a really good idea. Yeah. Yeah, it's a pretty great idea. I mean, I don't know. I wish we would actually critique each other's preaching. Like, yeah. that's what a district president and or circuit visitor circuit, or, yeah. you know, vice president should do. Like, does your, ser- should, does your sermon make sense or is it just word vomit? Because, I mean, that's... That it really is, I think, one reason why that's important is I think a lot of people, if you've been a pastor a long time, you don't really often know, like, if you have quirks or not. Right. You and don't know and you could think it's a good sermon reaching people and you're not. Mm-hmm. And to be able to actually point that out in ways it could improve, you know, that helps being a vicarage supervisor for me is one thing that helps me in my preaching. Uh, because... I'm always thinking of not only of setting a good example for the, but I'm also helping the vicar and talking about preaching and how it'll be heard. And I bounce things off of the vicar all the time. You've heard me do that. Like do that. I'll ask that exam example work. Yeah. Or something like that, you know? Oh yeah. Yeah. We'll go to the vestry afterward and we'll kind of ask about, well, how did this come across? How do you think this went? Yeah. Right. But uh, not a lot of pastors have that, you know? Funerals and uh, weddings, all the official acts. Right. (laughs) Right. You know, this is why I really like uh, one of the Erlangen theologians. His name was Basil. 
he would actually go and he wouldn't announce when he was going. He'd just go sit in the church, make notes during the sermon, and then go talk to the pastor afterward. Right. What a great thing. I mean, this is what should happen. It sounds like a good model because then it puts, I mean, a, a certain amount of stress upon the pastor to ju- not just rest upon his laurels, but to actually be constantly improving and making sure he's preaching properly. Right, exactly. Right. And the fact that, um, you know, if generally if a district president comes, what you ask him to preach. Right, yeah. You know, yeah, I... I think which is not his a, job according to human right. I mean, his job according to human right is to listen to us preach, to listen to us do Bible study. Right. You know, I mean, that's what we're supposed to be doing. So that way he can right. say, yeah, you know, your Bible study was kind of this meandering mess. If you tell a story, have a point. Right. <laughs> I've often wondered, you know, like, uh, you know, when when a congregation calls a pastor, there is a PIF form and there is a section where the district president makes comments, mm-hmm. right? I wonder how much, how well do they actually know this guy and what are they going on? How many times have they actually heard him preach? Exactly. I mean, <coughs> you know, district presidents are, according to the Constitution, supposed to go to every congregation in their district once, at least once in the three years. Yeah, and probably to listen. (laughs) Well, and it's always to listen. I mean, unless there's something else. So, like, I mean, I looked at it in Iowa East. I think we had, like, 120 congregations. That's only 40 a year. That gives you plenty of time. Mm -hmm. That gives you, like, 12 Sundays a year to do, you know, whatever. Yeah. That's not even counting, like, Lent and Advent. (laughs) Because you could say, well, the, the... You know, the circuit visitor can do some of that, and certainly we can, but we have our own pulpits too. Exactly. Right. I mean, unless you have someone you trust. And I can understand in bigger districts where maybe you can't get to them. Right. You know, uh, what's the big one? The, the English district? Yeah, the non geographical yeah, district. Yeah, the Slovak and the English districts are non geographical, which would be really, really difficult. But, you know. Well, the Slovak, it would be easier. That's pretty small, isn't it? I think so, but, you know, I don't want them to feel left out. I'm being a nice guy here. <laughs> hey, you know, the, the Senate have to pay for the, the flights. There we go. There you go. I'd rather drive, listen to audiobooks. Love it. That makes sense. So anyway, but, you know, in a lot of districts, it'd be pretty easy, actually, you know? Yeah. And if districts are too big, then they should be split up. Right. Right? I mean. and And, you know. What districts involve themselves in doing and be concerned with, they don't always have to be concerned with. Now, that's, I think that's changed over the years. You know, you know I remember times where a district felt like it had to do everything, you know. Right. Um, I remember, I remember uh, for a while I was the, I don't mean to brag, but I was the, uh, the chairman of the district's worship committee. Look at you. And... Uh, it was kind of funny. <laughs> this is true. I didn't realize I had termed out. And so I went to the worship committee meeting and they said, oh, yeah, you're not on this anymore. Okay. <laughs> so that's not like something I would do. Anyways. And uh, and most of the time was, you know, we would come up with, a, we're going to do like a, a pre-Lent workshop or something. And or do certain things, and the majority of time is well was spent, well, how can we get anybody to come or make use of this? Like, if it's not needed, why are you doing it? Well, that's the thing. is like, it is needed, just everyone else is going for other stuff. There's too much competition, right? Right. And so, like, I don't know. I've produced Bible studies. I've done all this stuff, and, you know, hopefully it'll come out here soon, you know, in a nicer form. But it's like, I don't know. I'm even feeling like, district doesn't do a lot and it's like i feel like i have to do it all so yeah i mean that's fine i can be a cowboy i can be a pioneer yeah. that's fine <laughs> but uh but then why what's the point of you is my question <clears throat> the berg district grows <laughs> it'd be a lot cheaper and number one to stand guard over the purity and unity of doctrine 
and to oppose false doctrine within the synodical circle. That's a great number one. That is a great number yeah, one. That is the number one. So, uh, and uh, I still think there are times where, like, if you're asked synod, they feel like their hands are tied in some of this stuff. Right? I imagine so. I'm not a. I'm not in any of those positions. So, but I can imagine they feel as though that's the way. But it's. Well, what is the point of them if they don't do that? Right. I. I mean. Yeah. So ultimately, when when you you kind of whittle this sound down, the point of synod is to purity of doctrine, uniformity, and training of, of pastors and missions. Having good pastors and good teaching and good learning in a uniform way. Yep. And the protection and extension of the church. Yeah. yeah. Which is good. Good work, Bullhagen. So yeah, did they miss anything back time. then? Any uh, anything you think they should add? In? No. No, if 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 Senate would just do those things, I would be happy. Can we add like a like a you know bi monthly breakfast? Yeah, like a yeah. fish fry kind of thing. Fish fry, there you go for breakfast. Yeah, sure, <laughs> any time of the day, whatever. <laughs> well, as long as it's not on Fridays, right? It, That's fine. It, this also reminds me. This whole discussion <clears throat> reminds me of also the same kind of discussions. You could whittle this down and have a discussion on what is expected of pastors. Yep. As well. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the Lutheran Confessions would say, Vicar, what is a pastor to do? To uh, rightly minister the, uh, to be, or uh, to be the steward of the mysteries, right? Right. Preach, yeah. teach, and administer the, administer sacraments. the sacraments, and work hard in all that you do to support those things. Mm -hmm. And uh, looks different from place you know, to place. Right. And I think more and more, I think you see an adoption of we want a pastor to be a, like a CEO of the congregation. Yeah. We want a, the pastor to be able to bring in more families or, or kids or do X. Yeah. Well, and then they get mad when the pastor brings in too many of his own kids. So <laughs> <laughs> that happens sometimes. <laughs> Oh, terrible. All right. Well, that brings us to the conclusion of this show. Uh, thank you, Berg. Thank you, Vicar. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, me. What am thank I you, Bullhagen. Yes, thank I'm just you, Bull rambling Hagen. now. Yes, thank you, Bullhagen. <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> We've been here for a while. It's yeah. time to go home. It's time to go home. This is Bullhagen. This is Berg. And this is Vicar. Mayor, your parad paradoxicals <laughs> be periodicals. Thank you for joining us. This podcast is available on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Questions, thoughts, concerns? You can contact us on Facebook at facebook.com slash clerical heirs podcast, on Twitter at clerical heirs P for podcast, or email us at feedback at clerical heirs.org. Thanks for listening to clerical heirs. See you next time.